What do you think about your creative push? Love it or hate it, let your opinion be heard by leaving a rating and review on iTunes. It only takes a couple minutes, and it's just about the nicest thing that you can do for podcasts that you love. Thank you, my pushers, for your valuable time in helping the show and spreading the word. Your Creative Push, Episode 358. Don't worry about tomorrow, don't worry about yesterday, because you can't fix either of those. One of them's not broken, and the other one's unreachable. You just wonder, what can I do today? You don't quit, you don't not quit, you just do what you can. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Young Min Brown, and my guest today is Murr Lafferty. Murr is the author of Solo, a Star Wars story, and the Hugo and Nebula nominated novel Six Wakes, the Shambling Guide series, and several self published novels and novellas, including the award winning Afterlife series. She's also the host of the Hugo winning podcast Ditch Diggers and the long running I Should Be Writing. And she comes on the show today to talk about her journey as a writer and her journey as a podcaster. She talks about rejectomancy and overanalyzing what rejection might mean, why she doesn't read comments or reviews, and dealing with the self doubt bully. She also talks about trusting yourself and trusting the people in the basement and how you should shape your creative resolutions. She also talks about goal setting, not just setting one goal, but multiple specific goals how she gives herself more experience points when she's doing her creative work, and the magic spreadsheet in gamifying daily word counts. Mer also discusses how she gets past difficult moments in writing, how her creative life didn't start until she started taking care of her own mental health and dealing with depression as a writer. And finally, Mer discusses the value of taking up different hobbies, hobbies that are different than the thing that is your main focus, and how she uses a random number generator to help guide her on which task to do next. I had a great time talking with Murr. Her podcast, I Should Be Writing, has gotten me through tough times in my writing career, and she had a lot of useful and actionable tips that you can take into your creative journey as well. And I should also warn you that if you haven't read or seen Solo, A Star Wars Story, there's a very, very minor spoiler uh, in this episode. So just be warned if you are a purist. But with that being said, I will jump out of your way and let you enjoy this wonderful conversation with Murr Lafferty. Enjoy. Murr, welcome to Your Creative Push. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for being on. I, uh, well, I, I got to admit, your theme song is stuck in my head for the past, like, maybe month. <laughs> I'm sorry. <Does> it... <laughs> you got to you gotta blame John and Elio for that. Yeah, it's, it's a great theme song, though, and uh, it kind of actually like in a nutshell kind of touches on what this podcast is is all about it's like i should be writing well i shouldn't sing it but i should be writing like i should be working on my craft and then but instead i'm sitting and watching doctor who Mm -hmm. (laughs) i think so many people can relate i can relate to that for sure like that's kind of the whole reason for this podcast is i spent so much time not necessarily watching doctor who but sitting and watching tv or doing anything else than what i knew that i should be doing so I, maybe a good place to start would be to talk about the the genesis of the podcast. Why did you start I Should Be Writing? Well, it's kind of funny because it was a very, very, very long time ago. But I started I Should Be Writing because, to my knowledge, there was only one writing podcast out there. And that was Michael A. Stackpole's The Secrets. And it was Mike talking about um, – he was often repurposing a lot of his – mailing lists and doing the essays, but everything he was talking about was high level stuff. And there was nothing to tell you, you know, that, that rejection you got, that does not mean you're on a blacklist and the editor hates you now. It doesn't mean that you are completely untalented and will never amount to anything. And authors notoriously do the whole rejectomancy thing, try to figure out what every single word in the rejection means, and let little stumbles halt their careers entirely and talk themselves out of everything. And so I realized that there needed to be a podcast for beginners, absolute beginners, who may not understand how publishing works and how trying to build a writing career works. But I was pretty new at myself at the time. So I was 
you know, flat out said, it's just for beginners from a beginner, but using what I, what I had already learned to propel me along. And I started interviewing pros to make sure I wasn't completely wrong. And, um, it grew from there. Yeah. That sounds a lot like my origin story too. Like me trying to figure it out too, like just having this kind of relationship with resistance, with laziness, with fear and doubt and uncertainty and all of the (laughs) imposter syndrome and all the things that, um, apply. And, uh, and then just kind of comparing that with people that have already quote made it, uh, Mm -hmm. and just comparing notes and seeing that everyone does kind of go through the same stuff. Just, did you find that that then helped you in your writing career? Oh yeah, definitely. I learned a lot. And also I made some really good connections to help out. I would see authors or editors that I had met through the podcast. I'd see them at cons and make better connections. And that certainly helped my career. Definitely. You mentioned rejectomancy. I, I haven't heard of that before, but it, so that's like swimming in the rejection almost like, like no, living in no, it. it's more trying to figure out exactly what the editor meant by every single word, you know, the editors say, maybe this isn't for us. Well, what does that mean? Mm. Does it mean that it sucked and this was a form rejection? Did it mean that they just bought something like it? Did that mean that you accidentally sent them science fiction when really they only published fantasy? And people can get really, really, really deeply into this way of thinking and it's just it just kind of leads to madness. If it didn't sell, it didn't sell. If they have suggestions on how to fix it, then consider that. If not, send it somewhere else. Where is the line then? Like, does it ever require a follow up? Like, does it ever require you to take their notes and send it back? Or actually, like, I guess what I'm asking is like, where where is the line where you can actually take that feedback and use it as opposed to overanalyzing the feedback and like maybe overusing it, totally screwing up your entire creative process. Well, that's, that's your call. Unfortunately that no one can tell you that. Um, but technically when it comes to the, um, editor, if the editor says, you know, I didn't really believe these characters relationship, it didn't have any chemistry or I really didn't get why he hated her or whatever. That's like something solid you can work on. But if they don't say, fix it and send it back to me, you need to fix it and send it to somebody else. They don't want to see it again. Right. That's that's pretty clear. You shouldn't ask to resend something that they've already seen if they didn't specifically ask for it. Right. No, that makes sense. Yeah. And I think people can not only have that rejectomancy <laughs> with that, but also like any type of like negative comment on like for visual artists on Instagram or on YouTube or on Twitter, just a couple words. Even my um, my cousin, she got engaged. Uh, well, she's married now, but when she got engaged and like she posted uh, a photo of the ring or, or actually the company that made the ring posted a photo of the ring and like there's like a hundred of comments, hundreds of comments like, oh, this is so unique, so cool. Then there's like this one comment where somebody tagged their friend. It was just like them tagging the friend and then like a eye roll. <laughs> And that's what she focused in on, you know, I think it's it's so easy to find the that one negative comment and to focus in on that and like have that like <laughs> affect your marriage or affect like the, the happiness that you have for for being engaged. It's so sick how it um it kind of permeates through. This is why you don't read the comments. <laughs> that's right. So is that I'm the serious, advice? Then? I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't read the comments. I don't read reviews. And some people say it may not be good to not connect with your readers. But number one, I, it it honestly just, it it shuts me down. Mm -hmm. I obsess, I worry. And also reviews are not written for the author. A lot Mm -hmm. of people think, oh, I'm going to say what I thought about this book and the author is going to take my advice and change because of me. And really reviews are for you to tell other readers, buy this book or don't buy this book. It's not for the author. The author can't do anything about it. That's the other thing. It's like, if somebody says, wow, this book sucked because of X, Y, and Z, I'm like, well, okay, I can't fix it, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to run to your house and scrabble out the part you don't like and then write in the margins something else. Mm -hmm. And also, reading reviews is a little maddening because every single person is going to have an opinion about your book or your story or your engagement ring. 
And you have to decide which one of those you listen to. Because if you just listen to one rando on the internet, then why wouldn't you listen to all the randos on the internet? And that could either drown out the eye roller or it could just make you insane because you don't know who to listen to because there's going to be different opinions. So at the stage of my career, I listen to my editor and my agent. And if readers have opinions, that's great, but they can talk about it amongst themselves because I'm not going to be influenced by that. Because if I hear like five different opinions, I'm going to sit there and go, well, where do I go? Which direction do I go in? So you got to learn. Everyone's going to have an opinion. Somebody's not going to like it. You should tell, uh, tell her to go to Amazon and read the reviews of Harry Potter, the Bible, Shakespeare, Neil Gaiman, there will be one star reviews in there a mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, somebody's always going to crap on your work and the bigger you get, the more likely you are to have people crap on your work. And that's something you have to realize you have to accept any creative person. Definitely. Sharing your work and then getting reviews or getting comments is one thing, but then you can have this other critic. You call it the, the self-doubt bully, <laughs> which I like. Yes. That is another critic that is really hard to deal with when it comes to actually creating, when you're actually sitting down and writing and you have that voice in your head. And maybe it's like a combination of voices that you've seen before, like when you have read the comment section, or maybe it's just like a complete fabrication and just an imagination of, of the worst case scenario, which I think it, it tends to usually be. Um, so one of your pieces of advice is, you know, just kind of ignoring that, like, it just, okay, so it sucks. So what, like deal with that later. I was wondering if you could talk about that mindset a bit. Well, we're all going to criticize ourselves and it's going to be based on things said to you when you were a child to, uh, how you're feeling that day, whether you've had a good, good breakfast or good night's sleep or not. I mean, there's so many things that affect our moods that we don't like to admit it because we just want to think we are perfect and pure. And when something happens, we react to it in this perfect and pure way when really it's not that way. And when it comes to dealing with the bully, you know that it's going to be there and it's going to say something mean because we're always ruder to ourselves than we are to anybody we love. Mm -hmm. And I just say, okay, well, you can, you can have your time to tell me I suck. And then I'm going to go over here and write, and you're going to be quiet for a little while. And then later on, you can tell me I suck, but you, you, you have your time and then you give me my time. And, you know, the anthropomorphizing the thing is, is kind of trite and fun, but honestly, it's, I have to tell myself, this is something my brain is doing because brains are stupid. And this is not the reality of the situation. <laughs> brains are stupid, emotions yeah. are stupid, and they drive far too much of our decisions. So, I mean, the stupidity part, obviously, brains got to decide the mm -hmm. decisions. But that's why it's important to, you know, try to sit back and think, is this really crap? Or is my career really over? Because X happened or Y happened or X didn't happen or whatever. Or am I just going to get up in the morning and keep writing? Right. Or not leaving that thing that you need to write 10 feet away from you. You mentioned that in one of your episodes recently, too, about, um, you know, trusting the people in the basement. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm still working on that that concept. But, you know, this is more for people who've been, been at it a little while. But you have the problem of... Um, you know, wondering how am I going to craft this story when you forget you've already crafted many stories. You know how this works. And it's like, if somebody throws a ball at you and you're a professional ball player, you don't think, okay, they threw it this hard. How am I going to catch this? What, 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 hmm. how fast is it going? How high is it? No, you put up your arm, you shift your legs a little bit and you catch it. And I try to tell myself that, okay, if I don't know what's, if I can't consciously think of how to fix this, Maybe I should just sit, sit down and write and trust the fact that I've been honing these muscles for a long time and I'll figure it out as I go because that's the way I write anyway. Right. And kind of kind of going along with the baseball analogy, uh, when, <laughs> when you're up to bat, it's like I think a lot of times we want to hit a home run every time or we don't want to even like swing the bat unless we – um, already have it predetermined that this is going to be a home run. Yeah. But it's like once you have that practice of, like you said, of trusting the, you know, trusting the process <laughs> and, and knowing that, you know, like you've done it before, 
Like you can kind of see like your work or your finished pieces or your even your first drafts or first paintings or whatever it is like as something that will fall on a spectrum. Maybe it won't be a home run, but it will be a single or a double or a triple and just like trusting that. Yeah. The important thing is like getting the hit. Like the important thing is actually swinging the bat and getting it done and then like evaluating it, evaluating it later. Yeah, exactly. Um, you also on your one of your recent episodes mentioned having pen and paper with you all the time and compared it to like flossing. Like we all know we're supposed to do it, but it's rarely mm -hmm. something that we actually do. I am guilty of this too. Like one of the like one of my biggest messages that I can't tell you how many times I've said it on this podcast is writing your ideas down. And it's just like so important mm -hmm. to just get it out of your head and get it down. But um and so often they come in the shower or when you're like in bed, laying in bed. I can't tell you, even though I preach <laughs> preach that so mm -hmm. often how many ideas I've gotten in bed and then just for some reason like thought that I'd remember it in the morning well it's so brilliant didn't. of course you'll remember it <laughs> I know right it's, sometimes it's not brilliant of course like sometimes it's like the most like was I high <laughs> like why did, yeah. why, why did I think that was a good idea last night but um but so often I, I like don't listen to my own advice do you have any words of encouragement then for people to actually do that flossing I think a lot of us are we have we have it in our minds that that all of our goals are destinations. And so this you know this might be one of the reasons why uh new year's resolutions don't work because the resolution is to get get stronger, get lose weight, eat better, all this stuff. And so once you reach that destination of being stronger and losing the weight, then you're done. So if you don't floss today or you don't write today or you forget to put down a, a an idea today, that doesn't mean you can't do it tomorrow. It's, it's a process. It's a, nobody wants to hear it's entropy because that's really what it is. You're fighting the entropy every single day. You, you floss your teeth and then the next day you got to floss them again. And you know, that's the same for anything else. So it's, it's all, it's all a process. It's all a journey. So there's no, there, there's really no failing and there's no like ultimate success. You can reach small goals, sure, but, you know, if you want to keep your weight down or you want to keep your teeth healthy or you want to build your career as a writer, you're not done. That's sometimes hard to hear, but it's the truth. Right. And not just like the daily activity of it, which I always like, it's kind of like a meditation. It's you have to uh, enjoy the process. And like, if you don't enjoy yeah. the process of doing it and kind of having that be a part of your life, then you're probably doing it for the wrong reason. If there is that kind of big goal that once you reach that goal, then it's all over. Like so often, even if you do reach that goal, like the goalpost just keeps moving <laughs> and you realize yeah. that, oh crap, <laughs> like they were right. Like I'm still on this journey and like now I have bigger and grander goals or I see that I'm not exactly where I uh, emotionally thought I would be uh, by reaching the success or finishing this novel or finishing this body of work. It just keeps moving and you have to like kind of mentally be okay with, with those, those daily um, rituals. Yeah. And I, I recently did a show on this. It occurred to me that I, I was, I was doing yoga and I thought, man, I, I feel like I'm always beginning doing yoga because I always stop. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I never sit down to think I am not going to do yoga anymore. I'm going to quit doing yoga. I, I never think that. It's just the days where I get up and say, I'm not going to do yoga today, pile up. And so very few people stand up and say, I am going to quit writing. I know a couple who have, but, but very few. And others just kind of that day they didn't write. And then the next day they also didn't write. And then... That's how quitting happens is is the days you don't do it start to pile up against the days you did. And it really is just a what can you accomplish today? And don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about yesterday because you can't fix either of those. One of them's not broken and the other one's unreachable. So you just wonder, what can I do today? You don't quit. You don't not quit. You just do what you can. Right. Uh, you nailed it too, because I think that not only do the days pile up, okay, like I didn't do it yesterday, it's a little bit easier to not do it today because you didn't do it yesterday. And that those days pile up, but also mm -hmm. the, like the shame kind of piles up until yep. like the shame is so much that you sort of like forget about it because you don't want to think about that shame. So then it's like, then it becomes this like thing in the back of your brain that you used to do. 
and I, I agree with you. It's not like you may, you have to make this declaration that you quit, but just as easy as it was to quote quit or or stop or take a take a break from doing it, it's that easy to start back up again and build that momentum. It's all about you know you do it a little bit one day, you do it a little bit more the next day, and suddenly it's like it's not even really a thought, and you can forget about the fact that you had that break (laughs) or you didn't call yourself a writer or an artist or whatever for that period of time. You just get back in the swing of things and to try to sort of cut out that shame. I think, I think you're totally right. Like it's just one day at a time. (laughs) You don't have to like beat yourself up for, for missing a day or a month or even a year, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. In your episode about resolutions anytime, you also mentioned giving yourself experience points. <laughs> I love any type of like like video game analogy that where mm-hmm. you can give yourself like points even if you don't necessarily accomplish what you set out to do, even if you, you know, you get experience points for failing and trying. Like you don't have to succeed yeah, every time unfair. you fight the monster. It's so unfair. Yeah. <laughs> that's really unfair because it's it's we learn so much by failing and So few games acknowledge that. I know one game that actually gives you more experience points for failing than succeeding, and I really like that. What game is that? Uh, I think that's Fallen London. It's like an interactive fiction uh, thing, but you build up skills as you go along. And so this is a wisdom check. And so if you fail, you get more wisdom than if you had succeeded. I think that's it. It's one of the interactive fiction stories out there. I'm not sure. Yeah, as I'm like starting to make videos on YouTube, like that's my newest thing. (laughs) So like I'm slowly teaching myself editing, but I'm trying to do it by the process of kind of like what we talk about in the podcast of like just starting and Mm -hmm. not having everything figured out. And it's like every video that I make, I try to do one new thing, like figure out an end screen or like figure out how to make my mic sound better. As long as the content is there and the message is there, like that's when like the first video can go up. And that really, it was just me laying in bed (laughs) and like holding Mm -hmm. the camera up um, and then slowly figuring it out. And uh, I think, so like when I created that first video, it's very overwhelming because there's so like I've watched a lot of YouTube videos I've watched a lot of movies and and stuff and there's like a whole world of things that I know that I could do but it's like trial and error as you create it I think it was Michelangelo maybe that said it's like having a big block of material then you just cut out the excess and that's how David is born you know super easy like that Well, like, but that's kind of the idea. It's like, you know, cutting away the things that don't work for you or trimming away the the infinite possibilities, like trimming it down to like the thing that works for you the most. I hope that that analogy made sense. But mm-hmm. it's it's really important to to be okay with like imperfection and to congratulate yourself when you accomplish your goal or congratulate yourself when you tried it, but still failed. Right. Yeah, I am. Um... I found a YouTube channel I really like. I think it's called Better Than Yesterday. Mm. And uh, it covers the focus and, and goals and stuff, but but puts some brain science in there. And one thing it talked about was a lot of times when we set goals and we fail, it's because we set one goal, which is I'm going to go to the gym every day. When really you need like like three different levels of goals. You need, I'm going to do yoga for three minutes. Or I'm going to do an entire yoga program on my on my app or on the uh, on YouTube. Or I'm going to go to a yoga class. And if you've got a day where you feel like crap, you can probably do those three minutes. And if you have a day where you have more, you can do the class. But there's no failing because if you if you make the smallest goal something that you can do in a very small amount of time or effort then you can always tell yourself you are moving forward with whatever you're working on. Um, we used to, well, I mean, I think people still are on it. I, I'm not on it anymore, but we used to have a, a thing called the mag- magic spreadsheet. A friend of mine did where um, all, that was also gamification, where your only goal was to write 250 words a day. And the key was consistency, not quantity. So, you know, you got a certain number of points for writing your 250 words, but those points are compounded by how many consecutive days you've written 250 words. So your streak became much more important than your word count, as long as you made those 250 words. And we found that 
very inspiring. Now, what happens when you're, I love that, by the way, <laughs> like, I think that consistency is, is way more important than having like one big crazy day where you write for, you know, 14 hours, mm -hmm. and then inevitably burn yourself out. So you can't write the next like five days. So like when you're doing something like that, like where you're aiming for, you know, just consistency every single day, and then you do have that kind of inspiration to write more, which, you know, I think people get like, I, I love the idea of setting the bar super low, like doing three minutes of yoga, inevitably, you're going to end up doing like 20 minutes of yoga. But mm -hmm. just getting yourself to, to do it as opposed to not do it like binary. Um, but anyway, like when you have a day where you're feeling like supercharged, how do you continue writing more than 250 words, but then uh, I guess, put, do you put a stop on yourself, like, so that you don't go crazy? Or do you, what's your process like? Do you just keep going until, <laughs> like, the wheels fall off? Usually, yes, but I wish I didn't. Mm. Um, I, my problem is I'm not really good at, fi at knowing where my limits are. So, like, I'll have a day where I feel inspired with a lot of energy, and I will write, like, three, 4,000 words, and it'll feel great. And the next morning, I'll feel like my brain is literally feeling like a wrung out sponge. Like I, my, my head feels different. It's my brain feels physically tired and I'm thinking, well, I overdid it. Crap. And you know, I didn't know when to stop. Those days are far, few and far between, but I, I wish I did know when to stop. It would be nice. But yeah, usually I just push on through. If I've got the time, I'll just keep going unless something distracts me. Which unfortunately happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Um, how about when you are up against a deadline? Like you recently wrote Solo, which mm -hmm. like I would love to talk about because I'm a nerd. I'm a Star Wars nerd. Yay. I'm an outer space nerd. <laughs> but how did that opportunity come to be? Um, well, I my agent knew the, the uh, editor for the Star Wars line and... The editor knew that I was very interested in writing for Star Wars because I, too, am a big nerd and it would Yay. just be a dream come true to work on Star Wars. And so I did a short story for the Star Wars Insider and then later on they asked me to do a uh, solo. So really that's that's all that happened. I was very lucky because I had a bit of a conflict in that I'd already agreed to do the Minecraft book. But luckily they were both uh, contracted by Del Rey. And so essentially it was they could go down the, the hall and say, hey, can we push back the Minecraft book so Solo can get out on time? And that's all it took. So I was very lucky that even though I had an outstanding contract, I could still make room in my schedule for Solo. Um, the challenges that I did not expect about Solo were, uh, I'm sure you've heard the Lucasfilm is notoriously closed when it comes to their scripts. Yeah, anal. Yeah. So, you know, you can't, like, they would, they don't even give people full scripts if they're not in a scene. And um, my, my favorite anecdote from that time is I had the full, full script to read over and make notes. I couldn't copy it, of course. I just had to make notes and I had one day to do it. And um, when I got to the scene where Darth Maul appears... Oh. <laughs> in the script it said this person is super secret and we can't even tell you who it is it, it <gasps> literally said that in the script <laughs> and because he's a hologram of course sure. no one needed to know who it was except for the actor and you know makeup or whatever and so i i contacted my editor and i'm like i get why they're doing this but i have to put <laughs> somebody <laughs> in the book and she's like yeah i'll try to find out who that is so <laughs> and then i had to realize that uh Kira, the character who was talking to him, would not have seen the first movie. Hmm. And I realized how, you know, if you think about the galaxy be being lots and lots and lots of planets and, you know, b billions, trillions of people, they might not know the people we think is notorious and instantly recognizable. And so I decided to write it like, who is this guy? He's kind of scary. Whoa, he used, was that the force? Uh-oh. And the other the other challenge was I I did have uh, the middle grade book was finished so I had the script my notes from the script and the middle grade book to go off of but then I had the challenge of 
how am I going to retell this scene so it sounds like it came from me, but it's still true to the scene? Because I couldn't plagiarize the middle grade book, and I couldn't just write scene, uh, you know, line by line the way the script was. And that was an unexpected challenge. And the way I went, got past that is I changed points of view in scenes. So, you know, scenes where we expect to hear it from Han's point of view, I told it from Kira's or Chewie's because that changed the scene just a little bit to get somebody else's opinions on what's going on. Smart, smart. Well, when you get situations like that where you're stuck, where you're like, oh, crap, like, I don't know where to go. What is your process of figuring that out, like coming to that conclusion? Like, is it just like sitting and meditating on it and thinking about it? Or do you like just write <laughs> and then see what comes out? I usually write and see what comes out. But a lot of it has to do with knowing when something's not working and then restarting. That's also a, a little tricky to try to figure out how to do it. But yeah, that's usually my sort of process. I'll just think on it for a little while, but then knowing I I have limited time, I just get to work and hope something works. Mm -hmm. Walks help. When I do walks and, and just let my mind wander. That's another thing like flossing. People say, mm -hmm. hey, if, you, if you're stuck, take a walk. And I'm like, I don't want to take a walk. That's outside. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what's outside? <laughs> Pollen and mosquitoes. I live in the <laughs> South, man. I don't want to go outside. But it's it's true. You know, you get out, you move around, your brain starts wandering, and it's a good thing. So it, it often helps. Yeah. Plus then your dog loves you too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so when, you, when you're finished a project like Solo or any of your books, what is that moment like? Do you immediately move on to the next one? I mean, I know there's a ton of administrative stuff that needs to be done, like submitting it and edits and all that. Um, but are you, do you already have another project going on? Like, are you working on multiple things or is it like one to the next? That, that varies. Um, with, with solo, I had to get back, get into the Minecraft book immediately. Um, I usually try to give myself some time just to decompress because oftentimes if I try to force my brain to think up new story, it will flatly refuse. Mm -hmm. And I can sit at the computer and do nothing for an hour and hate myself, or I can actually take that hour and take it off and give myself a break. I'll get the same amount of work done, but one of those situations doesn't have me hating myself. <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> yeah. Well, kind of speaking on um, not necessarily hating yourself, but you are pretty vocal in your podcast about um, dealing with depression. And it's mm -hmm. something that we try to talk about or at, at least bring to light on this show, like when mm -hmm. mental health comes into play, when you're a creative person and not just dealing with it, but um, balancing it with still being a creative person and not being too hard on yourself. I was wondering yeah. maybe could you talk a little bit about um, dealing with depression as a, as a writer, as a creative person? Yeah. Um, I did not start pursuing my writing career and working on podcasts until I got an antidepressants. Mm. And um, I hate everybody who says that a medication kills your productivity or kills your creativity or, or the people that need that look at like Poe or Hemingway or, you know, any number of famous people who happen to have alcoholism or depression or add add or subtract as you like, but mm -hmm. these problems and, you know, don't say this person succeeded in spite of all that. No, they say, though, no, that's, it's, you got to be an alcoholic like Hemingway. You don't actually hear anybody say that, but you don't hear a lot of people say Hemingway did some great stuff. Also, he was super sick. Yeah. It's like a rom romanticized almost. Or, yeah. I hate yeah. the romanticizing of mental illness and alcoholism because I got to tell you, my creative life really did not start until I took care of that. And there's so, yeah, I've heard that, that Prozac specifically can sort of deaden your creativity, but there's so many, so much more out there than Prozac. You know, there's, there's multiple drugs that don't mess with your creativity or your productivity. So I'm, I'm very honest because I worry about the stigma. I worry about 
I worry about people's well-being, but I also worry, secondly, about their careers in that, okay, if you if you think you need to suffer to create art, I wonder why your art is more important than your well-being. Mm-hmm. Someone's like, oh, well, if, if Van Gogh had gotten uh, mental health help, he would not have, you know, painted this. And I'm thinking, why why do you think that's more important? I mean, sure, we would not have the the beautiful paintings, but, you know, there would have been a guy who had a pleasant life who did not, like, self-mutilate himself. Mm-hmm. Wait, that's redundant. But still, it's like, <laughs> it's, you, you got to have... Yeah. You gotta have priorities and you gotta take care of yourself. It helps to take care of yourself before you start creating or taking care of anybody else, frankly, but that's not quite what we're talking about. But so I try to be completely honest about it because I don't want anyone to I don't want my lack of talking about it to keep somebody else from thinking it might be something they need to look at. And it's always the most gratifying thing in the world for me to hear somebody say that they, to say that they listened to my show and it encouraged them to go get some help. And that's the best feeling in the world. I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled when I hear that my listeners have gotten published, but just the fact that somebody wants to work on their career and work on their own mental health is even better. Cause hopefully like, because it, one leads into the other one. The healthier you are, the better work you're going to do. And if some random prodigy out there needs their voices or whatever, that's probably not true for most of us. Right. I hate that when people say that too, like, oh, if Van Gogh had gotten, (laughs) it's a perfect example. If Van Gogh had gotten mental help, then he wouldn't have created that but like if he had gotten mental help like what do you think he would have created like how exactly. much more would he have created like how different would it be you can't put yourself in that situation and determine that he would not have created that had he been a different way or had a, a writer not been an alcoholic like you know what i mean it's yeah it's icky and it makes me worried as well sometimes that there may be somebody's using that as an excuse for themselves like i use that exactly. excuse i'm an alcoholic and i used the excuse of oh my you know drinking makes me more creative and lets me loosen up but yeah it also makes me like stop writing after an hour because i just mm-hmm. keep drinking you know <laughs> like it's sometimes people use that as an excuse so they can maybe have that same behavior themselves yeah yeah it's really sad how do you, when you do have um, depression kind of sneak up when you're trying to create or be motivated, what is your mindset like during that point? Like, how do you stay motivated? Um, or do you sort of just give yourself a loving break? I have to give myself a break. Similarly to how I feel when I'm done with a project, you know, depression and a lot of people don't understand what depression is, by the way. You know, mm-hmm. for for several of us, it's just not having the ability to do anything. You know, it's not, there's no energy, there's no desire, there's no ambition. There's, you know, if you put on pants, you're like, wow, look at what I've accomplished. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And sometimes I'll get that feeling again, and it's either because, you know, I think it sometimes comes in cycles. I haven't tracked it closely enough, but my medication is the kind that that takes a while to ramp up and then it stays in your system for a little while. So if I miss a day, um, usually when I'm traveling and my schedule's off, I, I might miss a dose or two. I'll feel it the next week. And by then I've forgotten that I missed a day. And so I'm sitting here. So what happens when I get hit is I think, okay, this is so hard for me to say because it's, it's, I'm not the kind of person, I, clearly, I'm on medication. I, I'm not the kind of person to say all you need to do is, you know, eat right and exercise and take a walk and get some sunlight and you'll be fine. But that's not going to fix clinical depression. But all of those things do have an impact on your, your mental well being. And so whenever I get down, the first things I do is I check my sleep, I check my food intake, and I check to see if I'm taking my meds regularly. 
but because those things do have uh, impact on my mental well-being, I will check all of those things. And if by fixing those things, I don't perk up in a couple of days, I know it's time to probably call my doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm a freelancer and, you know, my, my deadlines are there, but they're not usually close together. So often I can take a day or two off without much penalty. And I know this is a great luxury and I know I'm very lucky, but I often find it impossible to write when I'm feeling like that. So when I'm doing that, I try to do self-care to see where this is coming from. And then if I can't identify it, I'll take the next steps. But usually it's, I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating well, I'm not exercising, or I'm not taking my meds regularly, or any combination of those. And then do you ever find that like, it it doesn't have to do with necessarily mental health or or whatever, but it's just writing (laughs) or it's just like, I don't feel like writing because I know you took up the violin recently too. And not to mention like you have like three podcasts, I think like there's I should be Uh, writing. Technically I, I, I co-edit escape pod, which Mm -hmm. is not, we, I don't always, you know, I rarely host it. So right. You don't have the full load of that. Yeah. And I, and we have producers, so I don't feel like that's doesn't count. That feels like I work on a magazine, not necessarily a podcast, but... <laughs> okay. And then Ditch Diggers, too. Sense. And Yes, and then Ditch Diggers. Do you ever find that you have, like, maybe too many things in the in the air, and it's like you got to do something that doesn't have an end goal, maybe, in mind, like like playing the violin? Um, Usually when I get overwhelmed, actually, that's happening to me right now, I'm go- I have to ch- take one large thing and focus entirely on that and get it done and then focus on the next big thing. All the while knowing that whatever I'm ignoring is being ignored. But if I try to deal with everything, everything's going to fall. So it's a tough decision to make, but I've realized I work best that way. The thing about the violin is awesome because I don't have to be good at it. Nothing requires me to be good at it. Nobody has any expectations of me to be good at this instrument. My parents are not expecting me to maybe go into music or maybe show myself to be a prodigy. (laughs) No one's going to get mad at me if I don't practice because I'm paying for the lessons myself. I can just play with this thing and no one cares. And it's such a wonderful, freeing feeling. So, um, yeah, it's fun to try that out. I know Cameron Hurley did the same thing when she took a painting. Cameron started dealing with some of her anger at current events by doing Bob Ross paintings and found that to be a wonderful outlet for her. Oh my God. Just spending an hour with, with a video of Bob Ross uh, has to be the most soothing thing in the world. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, it's, it's people say, find what you're good at and do it for a living. And that, I like that idea. But on the other hand, it's like the fact that, well, I I guess I'm already doing that. And now I'm just going to find something to play with that I don't have to do for a living. Right. And that is so freeing. And and just the ability to learn a new ability, like to, to do something that you're not good at and that you're learning, like I think is so important and something that people forget about, like after they're done college or whatever, is like how useful and how motivating and how freeing learning something new is. Mm-hmm. And it's just so nice to start to be able to master something new. And it's really nice to have... Um something else to do. You know, I didn't think about this, but I have a new skill that I can put in a book and can have confidence that I'm getting it right. My violin teacher told me this really obscure factoid about Benjamin Franklin that, yes, I'm putting into my next book because it's it fascinated me and I think it would it would fit a certain scene. So I'm not only putting a violinist in my next book, but also a weird Benjamin Franklin factoid. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Mm-hmm. I had one more question to ask you before we get to the final push. And um, it's something that I've heard you mention on I Should Be Writing, but I mm-hmm. haven't dug deep enough to get to the origin of it. And that's the idea of a random number generator. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so what is that about? Well, one one of the things that's hard about working for yourself is you don't have a boss. And everyone thinks that sounds great. But some of us need a little bit of guidance. And, you know, I look at, like I said, right now I'm kind of freaking out and I'm looking at my to-do list and everything looks like a priority. And it's really hard to 
prioritize. And then sometimes I'll come up against something I don't want to do. And I'll just be like, I don't want to do that (laughs) for some reason. And I don't know why it works for some reason. If I just assign everything on my to-do list a number and I roll a die or pull up a random number generator on Google and seven is rolled and I look down, I'll look at number seven and I'll do some work on number seven. It's like, I just need some sort of guidance, even if it's a completely random occurrence, having somebody else say, yeah, why don't you work on that thing mm. is, is what I need. And it, it makes me feel so weak to say that that works for me. And on the other <laughs> hand, I feel good that I have something that works for me. So totally. the only, the only place this falls down is if you do have a couple of things you do have to do and you keep rolling things like laundry and email, then you're priorities aren't going to get done. But somebody pointed out that when you roll, like, let's say the most important thing is number one and you roll a seven, well, you do what's number seven on the list and then you take seven and then you put it beside number one. So now if you roll one or seven, the most important thing will happen. So Uh. every time you do something, your big time goals, big time jobs get more and more likely to come up. So I've been playing with that concept. I love that. Well, do do you find that that's something that you've had issues with before? Like, because it's something that I definitely have issues with is putting admin stuff like emails ahead of, or laundry even, ahead of like the kind of difficult creative work. Oh, totally. And the problem is is that I know it's because, you know, you're supposed to eat the frog and do the hardest thing first, et cetera, et cetera. They say that all the freaking time. But... I'm, I've been trying to figure myself out. And I think when I do that, for if I do my writing first thing in the morning, my brain th- thinks, oh, wow, look at all that work I've done. Now I'm done. Mm. It, it's like looks at this this big important thing I did and says, it, you know, tries to check out for the day. And I'm like, no, 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 we got a lot of other stuff to do. And the brain's like, la, 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 la. And <laughs> it's, and I love the feeling of, you know, the laundry's done and folded and the email is inbox zero. And now I can sit down and write and my brain feels ready to write. And then I look at the clock and it's time to go pick up my kid from school. So it's, I've been trying to find a happy medium between having that happy, clean plate feeling to sit down when I write, but still managing to get something done. Right. Yeah. I think it's, that's different for every person. I think that can vary, very, even very, within people like day to day, (laughs) like one day you need to clear off like all that stuff because there's just like so many little itty bitty things like swirling around your mind. If you can just bang them out, just get them done real quick, then you can be mentally free. But then other times it's like, I know this is true for me, like getting a big chunk of editing or writing done, a couple hours of that frees me up to like be able to have the mindset to, okay, like, man, I am productive. I got done like this important stuff. Now let's get through like all these emails and get through like all this other stuff. And it's just like becomes like a super productive day. So I think Mm -hmm. it it definitely varies, but whatever works. And a lot of times I need to accept that if I have a super productive day, the next day may not be super productive and that's okay. Right. Like just the f- sometimes I, I get it in my head that I've had a super productive day. I'm on a streak now. I have to do it again tomorrow. And tomorrow my brain's like, you know what? We did a lot yesterday. So kind of like to not focus so hard today. And it's rough to know when you're like, no, I have to work. And when you can say, you know, I, I can, you know, have a productive day and then maybe a not so productive day and lay off a little bit. And right. that's, a, that's a balance. You got to figure out how to strike. Yeah. But like we said before, it's still congratulating yourself, giving yourself those experience points, and then at least getting that maybe minimum, like like, like you said, the magic spreadsheet, like getting that minimum mm-hmm. done at least so you can keep the streak going of consistency. Exactly. Uh, Murray, this has been awesome, but it is time for the final push. And that is where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your best final words of advice and push them to pursue their own creative passions. Okay. Don't quit. There's some people, and by some people, I mean me, because it's something I suffered with. Some people think that especially once you reach adulthood and you get out of school, you're done, like we said, you're done learning and you are as best as you're ever going to be at whatever your passion is. And that's what made me stop writing for a long time. 
because not only did I think I would never learn anymore, I thought I wasn't good to begin with. Forgetting that it's like a muscle. You do it and you get stronger at it the more you do it. And you can't get stronger at it if you quit. And if you just don't quit, but keep working at it, you will improve. I can't promise you'll get published. I can't promise you'll have an art gallery opening. I can't promise any of that, but I promise improvement will happen. And so if you just don't quit, just, just, that's the one rule. Every other rule in writing can be, you know, you, you don't have to write every day. If, if binge writing is your thing and you get writing done by writing binge writing, do that. It's fine. As long as you're getting it done, don't quit. That's the only rule. And, um, everything else you can take or leave as per your own experience. Don't quit. I appreciate yeah. it. Mer, thank you so much for coming on the show, for giving us that inspiration and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, it has. And uh, for everybody listening, you can find Mer on her website, merverse.com. That's M-U-R-V-E-R-S-E.com. And you can find everything we talked about today at the show notes page, yourcreativepush.com slash 358. Mer, thanks again. Thank you. Huge thank you once again to Mer for coming on the show. I want to leave you with one thought as you go on your creative journey today, and that is the powerful idea of consistency. Like Mer was talking about with her magic spreadsheet, a small amount every day is more important than the amount of words or work that you do in one specific day. And that ties in so well with what I'm always trying to promote on this podcast and what Mer was talking about with your creative resolutions needing to be a way of life rather than an ultimate failure or success. And I just finished reading The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield for, I don't know, the 10th time maybe, <laughs> but he stresses it as well. It's so important to just put in the work, to just get past resistance and just put in the time. That is your success. It's not the ultimate success or failure of a particular piece or or the thing that you're working on on that particular day. The success is putting in the work. And if you can put in the work, even if it is a minimum amount every single day, it becomes a part of you. It becomes something that you do, not something that you try to do. So just keep that in mind if you have that kind of gamification mindset after listening to this episode. Don't worry about setting a high score for a particular day. Just worry about playing the game every single day. Build that horizontal streak rather than that vertical streak. Just keep putting in the time, putting in the work, and building that way of life. On our next episode, we have Casey Golden. Casey is an illustrator and YouTuber with the dream of illustrating children's books. For now, she shares her illustration, her process, and her fun times as an artist on her YouTube channel where she pushes herself to improve her skills. You can find her channel at youtube.com slash Casey Golden, and on Instagram, she is Casey the Golden. That's K-A-S-E-Y, but we'll have that all listed at today's show notes page along with everything else we talked about with Mer at yourcreativepush.com slash 358. But that's all I've got for you today. So hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done. And we'll be here for you next week if you need that push again. I love you all so much. Remember to put in that consistency day after day. That is how you win the game of art. We'll see you next week. Hey, YouTubers, if you like this episode, I handpicked another one for you. I think you'll like it just as much. Just click it right there on the left side of your screen. And on the right is a playlist of episodes from guests that came from the same creative field as the one that you just listened to. And please, please don't forget to hit that like button on your way out before it goes away. Enjoy the next episode.